O Dia Nacional do Mar é um, o dia em que, em 97, Portugal aderiu a um convênio europeu para tratar destes problemas uh, e desde aí ficou consignado como o Dia Nacional do Mar. Uh, falar do mar, para nós portugueses, o mar é qualquer coisa que está no nosso coração, no nosso espírito, somos água, somos sal, por conseguinte fazemos parte desta, desta, uh, deste fluido maravilhoso. Para um químico, eu sou químico, e já não me apresentei, sou José Moura, sou professor de química e sou diretor da biblioteca, mas para um químico a água é a coisa mais maravilhosa que existe, e um químico é capaz de estar a falar três ou quatro horas sobre a água. Uh, e por conseguinte o dia do mar é, é qualquer coisa que me agrada muito realizar isto na biblioteca. Também gostava de vos dizer, dei-vos as boas-vindas, eu não vou fazer nada muito especial, são todos os nossos amigos que participam neste evento, mas o nosso diretor quer deixar um especial abraço por estar aqui presente e estar aqui presente connosco neste dia. Uh, o Dia Nacional do Mar foi uma oportunidade, uh, dedicámos este dia, mas uma oportunidade que só foi possível com a participação de uma parceria muito importante que nós temos com a Embaixada Americana, que são os American Corner. Temos aqui representantes da Teresa Roque e mais alguns representantes da Embaixada que estão aqui connosco, muito obrigado. E só é possível ter este evento hoje devido a este apoio, que é um apoio uh, muito importante para a nossa biblioteca, porque a nossa biblioteca faz parte de um conjunto de seis bibliotecas em Portugal e essas seis bibliotecas têm uh, este, este propósito de uh, amplificar uh, a interação cultural entre Portugal e Estados Unidos. E essa amplificação é feita de muitas maneiras, com seminários, pode ser com música, pode ser com teatro, com arte, e, e, e especialmente falar destes problemas tão importantes. Por conseguinte, é este o propósito hoje, o propósito de ter aqui dois oradores que vão estar connosco, vou deixar a apresentação para a Paula Sobral, que vai a seguir falar um pouco sobre os oradores e sobre o evento. Uh, de qualquer modo, não esquecer que em paralelo nós temos na, na frente da, da biblioteca temos um painel, um mural que se chama Impossible Bottle e não quero deixar de agradecer à Matilde Souza, ao André Pereira e ao Galmeida que estão sentados ao Kiri na segunda fila, que são os designers que já tinham provado connosco noutros trabalhos coisas muito interessantes, mas voltaram a provar uh, com a sua imaginação, trazer a problemática de uma maneira visual muito, muito forte. E lá fora, podem depois de, do seminário, contactar com os nossos colegas do Fab Lab do Porto, eu digo nossos colegas porque através desta parceria também, aqui mesmo ao lado, existe o, o Fab Lab da FCT, que é, já agora também passo a sua publicidade, é qualquer coisa que serve para a comunidade científica da FCT, mas para a comunidade em geral, é um espaço aberto, do it yourself, Uh, you can do almost everything, so é, a, é a ideia que vocês podem realmente usar o Fab Lab. E os nossos colegas estão aqui ao lado, exatamente, a reutilizar plástico, porque assim é uma boa opção mostrar aqui que uh, esta problemática pode, enfim, há uma esperança no fim uh, para utilizar estes plásticos de outra maneira. Então, assim, também agradecia que se quiserem ter um bocadinho de atenção a estas duas atividades, gostávamos muito que partilhassem. Já agora para finalizar, aqueles que não são nossos amigos da biblioteca, eu aproveito, vão ao nosso site, mailing list, pôr o vosso e-mail e passam a receber um newsletter com todas as atividades que se passam uh, na biblioteca uh, e na Faculdade de Ciências e Tecnologia. Muito obrigado pela vossa presença. Esta, esta experiência que vamos ter aqui esta tarde com, com o capitão Charles Moore, eu não vou falar sobre ele, que a minha, a minha colega Paula Sobral vai falar, mas só foi possível com esta colaboração com a Paula Sobral, que é do Departamento de Ciências do Ambiente, de Ciências e Engenharia do Ambiente, aqui da faculdade, uma pessoa muito implicada, muito envolvida nesta problemática e sem a experiência dela, os conselhos, não teria sido possível levar o evento para a frente. Por assim, Paula, continuamos com as apresentações dos nossos convidados. Muito obrigado pela vossa presença, é um grande prazer tê-los aqui. Muito obrigado. Ora bem, muito boa tarde a todos. Eu agradeço, agradeço as amáveis palavras do, do meu colega José Moura. É claro que é para mim um prazer difícil até de, de, de pôr em palavras o estar aqui hoje com uma pessoa como o Charles Moore. Eu conheci o Charles Moore enfim, já há uns tempos, já tive a oportunidade de, de estar em várias conferências com ele e de facto é uma, uma pessoa extremamente inspiradora, com uma energia notável e é muito difícil ficar indiferente a isso e 
por isso, desde, desde que me apercebi uh, desse facto, fiquei sempre com a ideia que seria uma oportunidade extraordinária poder um dia trazê-lo aqui, uh, a Portugal, a Lisboa, e ainda, ainda mais ainda, uh, aqui à minha casa, que é a, a FCT Nova. Uh, e, portanto, foi com, com, muito, uh, com muito, muita energia também que abracei esta, esta, este desafio uh, que me foi colocado pelo José Moura, Uh, e é com muito gosto que estou aqui agora a fazer esta introdução, portanto, eu penso que o capitão Charles Moore não precisa de grandes introduções, para a maior parte das pessoas que estão aqui, esta comunidade que se interessa por este problema uh, do lixo marinho e dos microplásticos, uh, portanto, foi a pessoa que uh, descobriu pela primeira vez uma grande acumulação de lixo flutuante no Pacífico Norte, e a partir daí ele conseguiu trazer para os mídia uh, esta problemática. Uh, o interesse da comunidade científica uh, nasceu muito a partir daí e podemos hoje dizer que ele uh, é provavelmente o pai de toda esta grande investigação que, que hoje em dia se faz em, to em todo o mundo. E, portanto, é um, um prazer para mim redobrado tê-lo aqui hoje. Um, vou também... Uh, enfim, para além deste prazer redobrado que eu tenho em trazer o Charles Moore, tenho também aqui um outro prazer muito, muito grande e até bastante, com alguma emoção, o expresso, em ter aqui também o João Frias. O João Frias foi meu aluno, foi meu aluno de mestrado, foi meu aluno de doutoramento, ele é o primeiro doutorado em microplásticos em Portugal. Uh, e, e depois fez um percurso notável uh, que uh, neste momento o levou até à Irlanda, uh, onde ele está há cerca de dois anos e onde ficará também mais um, mais um tempo, uh, aprofundando este tema uh, da sua investigação. E, portanto, é também com muita emoção que o vejo hoje aqui uh, e com muito contentamento e, e espero que este evento seja uh, muito proveitoso para toda a gente que, que veio até aqui. Uh, e que certamente levará daqui mensagens muito importantes que nos poderão, talvez, fazer pensar, é a minha esperança, pensar, mudar os comportamentos e, enfim, lutar por um mundo melhor. E, posto isto, não tenho mais nada a dizer. Muito obrigada a todos. Now, um, I will call João, João Frias. So, João Frias, please come. The floor is yours now. And thank you very much for coming. Hello, everyone. Um, while they are setting the, the presentation on the back, I just wanted to uh, first and foremost thank this uh, opportunity to, to be here today and sharing um, uh, my research and other things that I do in my, in my personal life. Out of respect to Captain Charles Moore, I will do my talk in English, uh, and I hope that you all can follow what I'm going to say. I will try to speak slowly so that everyone can uh, actually understand. Um, my name is João. I, I am an ex-alumni from here, from, from FCT. Um, Right now, I am a postdoctoral researcher, uh, principal investigator, and lecturer in the Galway Mayo Institute of Technology in, in Ireland. And um, I'm extremely humbled to be back to, to this stage and to this faculty, where I spent 13 years of my life since I was a bachelor student to the end of my PhD and my first uh, position as a junior researcher. Um, but also, it's a very emotional day to me to be back on this stage, uh, where in uh, 2013 I did my first TEDx talk, uh, but also where I've been here countless, countless times when I was part of the local theater group from the, from the university, Novo Nucleo Teatro, and it's also really nice to see uh, some of my colleagues who were in the, in the theater group with me in the audience, and it's, it's very, very a uh, big pleasure to me. Um, my talk is going to be about my personal journey um, to reduce marine litter and microplastics in, in, in the ocean. Um, and I'm going to make a brief introduction uh, to kind of make it easier for, for, for Charles. So my story starts uh, not far away from here, probably like five kilometers in the, in the beaches of uh, Caparica and Fontatalha, where I used to spend my summer holidays with my family. So it's a, it's a very special place to me. Um, and that was also one of the reasons why I chose to study in this faculty, because it was relatively close. And I was actually going back to, to old family photos. Um, and it was very interesting to me, because I couldn't find traces of marine litter. Uh, and these photos were taken in the 
80s and in the 90s, and it was very interesting for me to see that I couldn't um, see big traces of, of marine litter. Um, but fast forward to what is unfortunately common in Portuguese beaches. Um, this, this photo was taken in Alcobaça, close to, to Nazaré, um, after a, a storm event. This is the reality in some of the beaches, in some of the shorelines in, in Portugal. So actually, we find a lot of uh, plastic fragments. Um, these are resin pellets. Um, they are the raw material to produce all kinds of plastic. But we also find a lot of um, cotton swabs or cotton butt sticks, um, which could easily be out of the beach if we just, instead of putting it in the toilet, we would put it in the bin. It's a small thing that everyone in here can do. And I will go to uh, a lot of examples uh, as I share uh, not only the, the science behind it, but also what we can do as uh, individuals. So how did this problem start? It? I just wanted to share with you these two plots. Uh, for those of you who are within this topic, they are quite familiar with it by now, but this is partially why we have a problem. So on, on the right-hand side, we have the uh, worldwide plastic production, um, and you can see the blue line is representing the worldwide production, and the orange line is the um, European contribution to it. So it started in the 1950s, and it started with 1.7 uh, million tons, and the most recent data that we have uh, is from 2016, um, where you can see that uh, it reached 335 million tons produced worldwide. Now, this is cumulative, and you can see it's a um, increasingly, uh, exponentially increasing. It has only two peaks where it dropped, and it was the 1973 oil crisis and the 2008-2010 global financial crisis. These were the only two events that slowed down plastic production. Curiously enough, the other plot shows the, the scientific, peer-reviewed uh, journals, papers, etc., that are available, and you can see that it was only 15 years after that we started, 15 years after the, the production, that we started seeing the first traces of plastic in the environment, and it follows the same trend. Um, it, it, um, as time goes by, we have more and more papers and more and more documentation on this. And one thing that I wanted to point out is the purple section, which represents microplastics. So microplastics is a term that only, uh, that only started, um, that it was only coined for the first time in 2004. So microplastics existed before, but we just didn't call it that. So you only start seeing papers on microplastics from 2004 uh, onwards. But what is marine litter? What are microplastics? Um, I'm going to share with you some of the, the definitions, kind of to make it easy. And marine litter is any persistent, manufactured, and processed solid material that is deliberately or unintentionally discarded, disposed of, abandoned, or transported by wind, rivers, sewage streams, and animals into the marine and coastal environment. This is actually the definition that it's in the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. And as you can see in the photos, uh, it can be different types of materials, so means metal, processed wood, plastic, but also different sizes and shapes. And microplastics. So there, are, uh, there is one very famous definition for microplastics, which is plastic particles below five millimeters in diameter, but uh, for me it was not enough. <laughs> there is another definition that uh, distinguishes between primary and secondary microplastics, and because I was not happy with it, I just recently wrote a paper on it that was accepted by the journal three days ago, where we tried to create an all-inclusive um, um, definition and the definition that we propose, myself and my mentor in, in Ireland, Dr. Roisin Nash, is any synthetic solid particle or polymeric matrix with regular or irregular shape, which has a size ranging from one micron to five millimeters in diameter, either of primary or secondary origin, and it's insoluble in water. Just to give a scale so that we can understand what a microplastic is, if we, see, if we think of a pencil, um, and this is a very good, uh, good example from the US government, we can see that the rubber in the pencil, it's approximately five millimeters, that's the um, biggest size range for microplastics. Everything below that, it's, uh, it's called the microplastics. 
according to the origin. They can be primary, like these ones, which are deliberately produced to have microscopic scale, and usually they are uh, in our toothpaste or in our exfoliants or in shower gels. These are added particles to our personal care products. Um, the other ones are uh, secondary microplastics, which result from the fragmentation of larger items of, of plastic. And what we can see is that as uh, the big pieces start to fragment and degrade, we start to have more and more microplastics. Again, of different sizes and of different types, like styrofoam, polyethylene, polypropylene, etc., depending on the polymer in which, in which the, the plastic is made of. They represent a lot of impacts. Uh, some of the photos might shock the, the most sensitive people in the audience. Um, we have different, different impacts. Uh, most of them are environmental impacts or impacts on wildlife, but also uh, more recently we have socioeconomic impacts uh, expressed directly in loss of tourism revenue. Uh, so it actually has an impact on when people decide, I don't want to go to this, to this uh, beach, because it's dirty, because it has, um, it has a lot of plastic. But also it can represent a financial cost on days lost at sea uh, when the nets entangle vessels. So it's, it's important to take into consideration um, these this items. And just because we don't see it uh, when we go to the beach doesn't mean that it's not there. Sometimes it's hidden, and that's why we start doing uh, a lot of research on this. So as Professor Paula was, was mentioning, um, and I'm extremely humbled to, to again be back to, to this campus um, where I did this uh, paper, um, which was the, the work from my master thesis. This was the very first paper on microplastics in Portugal. It dates from 2010. It was uh, quite innovative back then because uh, we collected be, um, plastic in two beaches, one north to, to, to Lisbon, Guinshu, and the other one to, to south, um, Fontatella, one of my summer holiday beaches. And we were trying to, to compare um, and trying to see uh, the differences between them in terms of uh, persistent organic pollutants that were absorbed to pellets or um, actually identify the type of plastic. So we, we had the, uh, a very good partnership with the Department of Conservation and Restoration of Art here in this faculty because they own uh, a FTIR, which is a spectroscopy technique that uh, we need to have consistent and good quality data. Because of this project, we were invited to attend UN meetings in Paris in 2010, and our work has been constantly being cited, not only this paper, but all the other papers and all the other um, uh, works that the group here has been doing. Um, and we are part of reports uh, from GAZAMP, they have a really long, difficult name. They are the joint group of experts on the scientific aspects of uh, marine environmental protection. Um, and these people in the, in the UN gather our data and then they go directly into the international stakeholders and decision makers. So uh, we are kind of a reference, even though uh, most of the times we don't get the proper recognition within the country. Um, this is another, uh, um, another project that we did uh, on evidences of microplastics in zooplankton sam uh, samples uh, from Portuguese coastal waters. These samples were opportunistic samples. They, they were samples that were in IPMA uh, and uh, we, we, we managed to go through them and we find a lot of fragments and a lot of styrofoam but also we discovered a little bit of uh, paint chips from the vessels that degradation was leaving these this items floating. Because we are talking about zooplankton samples, these are surface water uh, samples, so they tend to be lighter um, types of plastic. And again, with our partnership uh, with the Department of Conservation and Restoration of Art here, we could, um, we could match our pellets that we found on the samples and have almost an exact match with low density polyethylene and this shows we knew already it was plastic, but what kind of plastic? Now we can share this information. By the way, all these papers are available online if you look for the titles, and if, you don't, uh, if you're not able to find them, you can contact me directly and I can uh, give it to you. 
Um, the more and more we looked into microplastics, the more and more we saw that other people around the world, um, when, when they were reporting their findings, were talking more and more about fibers. So fibers is actually the, the type of microplastic that we find uh, more uh, across the, the globe. And when we did, uh, because we had another opportunistic sample to sampling to, to, to check coastal sediments, we discovered a lot of fibers, as you can see uh, from, from the photos. When my PhD finished, I was kind of a little bit lost, but then I found a, a job and I moved to the Azores. It's, a, it's an archipelago, uh, it belongs to Portugal, for those of you who don't know it. And I was living in the Blue Island, in Fayal, in Orta City, and I was part of this project called Azorlit, uh, which uh, aimed to establish a baseline on marine litter in the Azores. They had different types of, um, the project consisted of uh, education and outreach, uh, awareness and outreach. Um, it had uh, sampling at sea, uh, intertidal sampling, and then um, checking um, uh, bioindicators on biota. And I'm only going to share with you two parts of the of the um, of the project that I think they are relevant and they kind of uh, are very important for people to know. So one of the things that we used to do, we used to do necropsies on Corishi waters, uh, Calonectris borealis de Omedea, and we sampled 100 and almost 150 uh, of this, these birds for the first time that they were leaving the nest, so they had never left the nest before, they were fledglings, and we found plastic in 84 of them, so it, within their uh, digestive gut. Um, same thing with the loggerhead turtles, careta careta. Um, we had a smaller sample, we only had 23 um, animals to, that, we, that we processed um, while I was there, and um, we found plastic in 83% of them. One of them uh, had all these plastic pieces inside their uh, gut. So um, the, the, the thing that I like to focus on the turtles is that we, we found a lot of plastic bags, uh, both transparent and bluish, and if you think they are migrating animals and they go through the Azores and when they reach the Azores, we have uh, a lot of jellyfish, which are transparent, and a lot of Portuguese man wars, which are blue. So maybe uh, it's not a mistake. Maybe they are going directly to the plastic bags of these colors because they resemble food. You know, it's more curiosity trying to get the prey than actually by mistake. And I moved two years ago to, to uh, Galway, very rainy, <laughs> very green, <laughs> but also very nice. Uh, and since I'm there, I've been working in this project called uh, Baseman. Um, it's a project uh, designed to create standardized uh, methodologies um, so that studies can be more easily compared. We do a lot of uh, uh, proce proceedings for how to sample, how to process, how to evaluate data. So it's not really sexy science, but uh, it's science nonetheless, and we are trying to, to establish standardized protocols that everyone around the world can use and that uh, can benefit comparison among studies. And I have a, a PhD student, Elena, and she just had her paper published recently uh, on microplastics in Galway Bay, where she compares different sampling techniques and uh, separation methods, and it's quite new. I would uh, recommend for you guys to, to check it. This is my most recent project. It's called Impact. That's the logo over there. It's like uh, that tiny drop, it's actually causing the, the ocean to, to change. And it's, it's a project um, to create, again, a, a baseline, because in Galway, we don't have much data on what is uh, happening around the bay. So I'm sampling um, the, the beaches and the shorelines, and I have, uh, the, the, I have a very good opportunity to go on board of the Celtic Explorer, uh, uh, the Celtic Voyager, which is one of the vessels from the, the Marine Institute, where we sample uh, surface waters, uh, where we collect sediments, and where we actually collect biota samples that we then bring to the, to the lab to check. And you can see we always find uh, microplastics in the surface when we do our mentatrol sampling. Um, so this is what I do as a researcher but I have a different side to myself because I always think that it's very good to have the data, but it's not enough. Um, and I, I want to share with you um, 
this, this photo because it's very dear to my heart and I'm so, again, humbled because there are so many people from this extraordinary organization in the audience today. This is the Portuguese Marine Litter Association. I'm very happy that I am one of the co-founders with Professor Paula and with so many other people that are here today. Um, it started in 25th of November 2013 and since then it's a very relatively new uh, association. Since then we have been doing um, I don't even know how to put a number into it, but so many partnerships and collaborations, doing outreach and awareness in schools, doing uh, beach cleanups, doing several campaigns um, that are absolutely important and interesting to bring uh, social debate so that people are aware. We have partnerships with Doca Pesca, we have kind of uh, um, a project going on that it's similar to other projects like Fishing for Litter, um, which I'm very proud that we put out together. Uh, we are partners of the Beat the Micro Beat campaign, which is a, 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 an app that you can download into your phone, and when you go to the supermarket and you are not sure if that product contains microplastics or not, you just uh, tag the barcode and it will tell you. The app will tell you if the product has microplastics in it or not. Um, we organize conferences and through these conferences we, um, we interact with uh, the Portuguese speaking country community um, which is also part of our mission, you know. We feel that we have the responsibility not only to do this in Portugal, but to go to the Portuguese speaking countries. Um, it's our responsibility to um, help and promote uh, outreach and awareness there as well. And here we have a photo of Professor Paula doing a, a talk in East Timor a couple of years ago where we went there and actually we put up in the international agenda of the Portuguese speaking countries uh, marine leader for the first time. I, we know that um, it's, it's a down the line uh, problem in terms of what is needed when we are talking about um, countries like East Timor or uh, Cape Verde or other countries or Saint Tomé Príncipe um, and we need to take into consideration that there are other uh, social issues going on but at least there's a political worry to go uh, in this direction. We are also partners of the Indonesian Waste Platform and uh, we recently uh, had a, repre a representative in Bali um, in our Oceans Conference, which is a big conference where, again, we try to expand and uh, promote these activities. Part of the work that I'm doing, even though I'm in Ireland, is I liaise directly with Ocean Conservancy, which is a USA uh, NGO. Uh, and they organize for many, many years international coastal cleanup and I have good relationships with uh, a lot of people uh, down, down there, down in America and we organize the international coastal cleanup uh, so probably you've participated in some of these events. Uh, we did it every weekend in the month of September here in Portugal from north to south, only mainland, but it was good to see so many volunteers and so many people engaging uh, and see that actually um, we, can, we can do a lot to change. Um, this is uh, us in, in California this year when we showed uh, a poster on the Portuguese partnership on, on marine litter, uh, what we are achieving. And I want to thank not only the, the people who are in this photo, but also Patricia, who is not here, Isabel, who is in the audience, and Flavia as well, Joana, Diana, everyone who collaborates with us, who dedicates their time, which is our most precious asset, to do this sort of activities. I am really, really proud to be one of the very few male around such powerful and strong women. <laughs> and you should be too. And what I, sorry, was a little bit fast. My dream is to change this back into this, how it should be, how it was pristine, and we need to go back to this. And we need to go back to this by changing our behavior and I'm going to talk and say exactly the same thing that I said in 2013 when I was on this stage when I gave that first TEDx talk. We, need, we know the very first three because we actually go and buy the products and we actually put the bin in the curve. We know that we need to reduce consumption, we know that we need to reuse products and we know that we need to recycle packages or whatever it is. But please let's refuse single-use plastics. By single-use plastics I don't mean everything 
because we need single-use plastics in hospitals, for instance. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to, to, to conduct and to save people. But we don't need straws. We don't need cups. We don't need cutlery made out of plastic. We don't need styrofoam boxes. We don't need our bananas to be wrapped in plastic. We don't need our vegetables to be wrapped in plastic. Um, and we need to rethink our lifestyle. When we rethink our lifestyle, we will go back very easy to the reduced consumption. And over there in this photo, in this table, it's some of the personal things that I have. Uh, I have a couple of items that I actually bought in, the, in, the, in Algita when I was uh, with Captain Charles Moore in his boat in California. So I have now my bamboo toothbrush, no plastic, my metal straw, no plastic. This is a Cora ball that you can put in your washing machine and it will collect the fibers from your clothes. It's a very good solution so that they don't go down the drain. It's, um, it's a USA uh, invention. You can check it, Cora Ball. You can check Dr. Rachel and you will find this. I have always my cloth bag. I have my metal spork and of course my metal bottle. And there are so many things that we can do um, and it's, it's really in our hands to, to change this. And I just wanted to thank you for this opportunity once again, and have a nice day. <laughs>